Welcome to Veterans Health Watch. The VA Maryland healthcare system is here to treat veterans from all walks of life. But veterans who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or LGBT are less likely to seek healthcare treatment. The problem is this population of veterans are at an increased risk for a myriad of health problems. And Tracy, thank, thank you for joining us. As a veteran, can you, who now even works with veterans, can you help us to understand how the military culture impacts how you seek, how a veteran seeks healthcare treatment? Uh, sure, um, I can say it's different now, but when I was in between 85 and 89, um, it was before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I mean, I was very concerned and worried. I, you know, I couldn't come out to anyone. And um, I mean, you could actually go to like Leavenworth, you know, jail for that. Um, I don't know how often that happened, but um, anyway, and I work with a lot of folks who I would say um, are, are, I think things are better. They definitely are better now than they were back then. Um, I feel very comfortable now with my doctors. And, uh, and Julie, Tracy mentioned actually talking to our doctors and, and coming out to our doctors and being a little concerned about that. Why is it important for a veteran to come out to their doctor or share that information with their with their clinician? Uh, that's such a great question. Uh, one of the problems that the LGBT community has is that they've been discriminated against for so many decades and years that people are afraid sometimes to come out. And so what we know is that LGBT community, people in that community are much less likely to seek um, primary care services, they're less likely to have a primary care um, provider help them, they're less likely to get mammograms or pap smears, um, and yet they're also more likely to have some health problems like weight, substance use disorders, things like this. Not because there's anything wrong with that population or with this group of people, it's because they've been discriminated against for so long. Um, and then there's also this thing called minority stress. A lot of the, the individuals in the LGBT community have a lot of stress because they're a minority and they're discriminated against. And then on top of it, they may have multi-minority stress. Um, so they might be people of color and LGBT. And so there's a lot of, a lot of stress. And so it's hard for people to seek uh, care, but really important to come in because um, LGBTQIA health is important, as, as important as anyone else's. Right, right. And like you said, it's not, it's about just coming in and getting that health care. Yeah, just knowing that we're here. And Jillian, why is it important for veterans or for the, the clinicians to be more proactive with our veterans in, in this area? And how do you help them do that? So my role is the VA um, LGBT coordinator for Baltimore uh, and Maryland is to provide education and outreach. So I outreach to the community. We've, provide, we've been participating in Pride for the last few years. And I do a lot of education within the system, um, teaching people about appropriate language, um, about what kinds of questions that are appropriate to ask, what things to not ask, people that they would be offensive. The idea is, is to create a safe environment. And so that's what we've really been working on, putting up posters, welcoming LGBT persons. The rainbow lanyard is a sign that is also for welcoming and just creating an atmosphere of openness and acceptance. And Tracy, how would you, you said you, you, you did this years ago. How would you suggest a veteran approach this topic with their provider and why, why would it be important to do so? Well, one thing, I, I had to get, just get comfortable in my own skin. I had to be comfortable myself and um, I just, uh, I felt that it was important to be honest with the doctors for my health um, so that they knew everything and I it just feel like it's just a normal thing now. I mean, it's not a big deal because I've come out a long time ago. So. You said it's not because you did it a long time ago, so you had some time to kind of make it a normal thing. And, right. and so, so, Jillian, how do you work with it? What kind of tips do you give the clinicians so to I help? I think one you? tip is we, you know, looking at our forms and um, having more than just male and female check boxes, not assuming that someone is a spouse, you know, asking who is the person that's with you, is that your partner? And the, and the medical provider's willingness to ask about sexual preferences, saying things like, who are your sexual partners? Men, women, both. Because that way it opens the question to everybody and normalizes the um, questions for all people because LGBT is just another spectrum of the human population. And Julie, so it's, you work in the mental health field and we, we talk about veterans coming in for that care and reducing the stigma. We talk about reducing the stigma in mental health and just overall in understanding that this is about health care. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's super important, whether someone's coming in for their medical issues or whether they're coming in for mental health. And sometimes they may be coming in to actually make adjustments or adjust to um, coming out or the stress of being in the LGBTQI community, but they also might just be coming in because they have problems with depression or anxiety. We also have fantastic services for couples in our in our VAMEX that people aren't, aren't always aware of and so an LGBT couple might not or same-sex couple might not come in for treatment because they don't know. Mm -hmm. so it's really important to, to ask and talk to your providers because they can refer you to all sorts of really great affirming care here. I think the providers in uh, a lot of the different programs that I with, with which I interact are doing a great job of really trying to be affirming and to be open and learning about um, how to best care for for provide for and, and you make LGBT. a good point about learning and trying to be affirming a point and so we want our veterans to be comfortable too Absolutely. and when they when this is all this some of this is due to people to this perspective of, of health care and, and and the LGBT community and how coming out to your doctor can impact that health care but um, what about privacy so if a veteran is thinking that's my business how, how can our veterans feel secure in that? So way? we all, as all healthcare clinicians, we file HIPAA. Um, HIPAA, HIPAA is the regulation that uh, um, has to do with privacy related to everything, to your medical records, to what is shared, in a, whether it's a group therapy or an individual session. It is all covered under Privacy Act, and um, the clinician would, would be censured if something were to, if they were to violate that. Great, great. And, and Tracy, again, you work with veterans, so what, what kind of... What is the sentiment you're getting or the sense you're getting from veterans now? Well, uh, it's better than it used to be, of course, uh, even what I'm hearing. Uh, I know that there have been people who told me that they were afraid to come out to their doctors. Um, I, I haven't really heard anything in, a, in the last year that I've been here. I haven't heard much uh, in a negative way, but I am not exposed to a lot of, diff uh, a lot of people, so it's, I'm not sure. But I do, th I do know that it's better. One of the comments that I'm receiving a lot is that um, a real appreciation that it's not so hard to come out anymore and then a real appreciation that there are so many more providers here at the VA who, who are working with LGBT folks and who really know what they're doing mm -hmm. and are you know, specializing in that care and really trying hard to, to be good. I know from having been at Pride for the last few years, we've had many veterans come up to us at the booth, the outreach booth, um, who did serve under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and some of them have just been absolutely moved to tears and not able to speak, just saying how validating it was to see the VA's presence at yeah. the Pride mm -hmm. celebration. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I heard comments like that too, yep, the, just seeing the VA there mm -hmm. just made them feel so about much acceptance. more comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. But, and like you said, it's about acceptance, acceptance. And, and knowing that the VA is here for you. Right. That's what we want our veterans right. to hear. So if a veteran has more questions about um, health care options and just uh, the LGBT program in, in general, where should they go? They can um, contact me through the website. The, the VAMEX website has my listing for the LGBT Veteran Care Coordinator. Um, my name is Jillian Silvera, and if you could just look it up that way. Maryland.va.gov for our go. veterans to get more information. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today and for giving us that insight. We really appreciate your service and what you're doing for our veterans. Thank you, thank you very much. Honestly, it was hard adjusting for both of us, so I know we were both going through a hard time. So I said, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm going to, you know, break things off. Well, apparently, nobody breaks up with her, and she beat me up and um, yeah, beat the crap out of me. She broke the blood vessels in my eye and I had claw marks on my face, like big gouges. Here I was an officer and I just got beat up by my girlfriend. It's an embarrassing thing. You know, you, you feel weak, you know, especially that it happened to you. And so the most important thing is understanding that there's resources out there, you know, that help LGBT. I didn't realize, honestly, when I got out, how much um, I was holding in. I started going to the VA regularly. They just swooped in. They recognized me and they said, we care. We want to make it clear that intimate partner violence can happen to anybody. I think the first thing to do is just to make sure you're safe and supported and your basic needs are met. It's not a weakness. It's actually, it's stronger for you to ask for help. 
It's often when people have gone through trauma, um, there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. No matter who they are, where they come from, their sexual preference, we do not discriminate here and we want to make sure that they feel comfortable with the care we provide. It is part of my goal to always tell them it's not in your mind, it's real and it's you're not alone. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, doctors, nurses, which range from LVNs to RNs. We have social service technicians. We have everyone that you can dream of to help you. It is 2018 and we're dealing with a different population that has different values, different beliefs, and that it is multifaceted and we embrace all of that here at the VA. It's very population focused and we get to think about, you know, how what we do today is maybe just one step in how there can be healing 10 years or 20 years or 40 years down the road. I choose VA for healthcare because the VA, they understand veterans. I heard about the VA from some friends, so I decided to check it out for myself, and I'm actually glad I did. And VA provides services with veterans in mind. I also have private health insurance, and I can see any doctor I want. But as a veteran, I like the care that I receive at the VA. I'm a veteran. And I choose VA. If you have experienced trauma and are experiencing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or if you have been diagnosed with PTSD, the PTSD Coach app can help. With this app, you can learn about PTSD, track symptoms you may be experiencing, manage those symptoms, and get support. Let's look at the four main features of the app. In the Learn section, you can read about what PTSD is, as well as the ways PTSD is experienced, how it can be treated, and how to get into treatment. The Getting Professional Help section includes information on effective treatments for PTSD and answers to common questions about counseling and therapy. Learn ways to develop and maintain good relationships with loved ones in the PTSD and the Family section. Decide if family or couples counseling might help you achieve your goals and get tips on how to help children handle stress they may experience when a parent has PTSD. The Track Symptoms area of the app offers the ability to take an assessment of symptoms you might be experiencing. You'll answer questions about your thoughts, feelings, and behavior over the past month. When you complete the assessment, you'll be given brief feedback based on your score. You can retake the assessment whenever you like, allowing you to track your symptoms over time. You can also track your progress in the Assessment History section of the app. In the Schedule Assessment section, you can set a reminder to take the assessment periodically. You can select Tools for Symptom Management in the Manage Symptoms section, and you can report your level of distress with the Distress Meter and get exercises that help. You can even create your own symptom management tools. If you're in crisis, you can choose from resources in the Get Support section that will connect you directly with people who are ready to help. You can learn more about professional treatment options and locate a mental health care provider near you. You can also learn how to grow your personal support system by connecting with people you trust. PTSD Coach is free and easy to use. Download today and start using tools that can make a difference. I don't have much memory for about 45 days. I was in the hospital for 45 days with a ruptured brain aneurysm. And during recovery, my brain swelled and I had a stroke and that's what called the caused the vision loss. Where he had the brain surgery, they, he went through some rehabilitation therapy just for walking and speech and things like that because he had laid there uh, for 45 days. And um, there's just not a lot out there for vision therapy. People didn't focus on that. They didn't guide us. They didn't give us any direction. So he went 11 years. 
struggling, searching. We made up techniques at home. We just made up our own uh, scavenger hunt. Can you find this? Can you find that? Yeah. Uh, eating out of a pie plate instead of a flat plate so it doesn't go off the edge. It, everything. That's we just modified ourselves. Everything, yes. Um, every move that he makes was different. So it's basically when we go places, like I'll say, okay, seven steps, or I'll walk in front of him so he can just get the path. So I'm kind of like uh, a seeing eye dog. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that came in handy was colors. I didn't have, I, I couldn't see anything but black and white. She had a yellow car and I couldn't tell. It was, it was bright yellow, I couldn't tell. She had the idea of getting Easter eggs colored Easter eggs and then putting the color into the you know piece of paper inside the egg. Then at nighttime before bed I would look at the color of each egg and try to figure out what it is, then open to see if I was right or not, then focus on that color. And within a few weeks I can see colors. So after that we um, kept researching nothing, there's not a lot available for low vision or vision therapy. So we went to a prestige eye clinic in Baltimore, um, thinking they would definitely be able to help us with some low vision techniques or therapy. So it was just by chance when we got there, they asked if he was a veteran. He said yes, so they referred us to the Lock Raven VA uh, Low Vision Center. They gave us the name of Dr. Olga Whitman, and they called her when we were there. She called us right away the next morning and made an appointment. So when we came here, uh, in the very first visit, we could not believe it. And do you have any concerns about your vision today? Or everything is about the same? Everything is about the same. Good. From the second I met Wes, it, it, it was just an, it was an incredible experience. Uh, given the fact that Wes has been uh, suffering from this condition for the past 12 years, he is, attitude and his um, outlook in life is remains so positive and uh, that was half the battle. So initially we just checked his vision, we did visual field test and became evident very fast how little vision less has remaining. So um, imagine that um, we have 140 degrees of a vision in general, 140 degrees of a side vision. and. Um, um, draw the line, vertical line and horizontal line in the quadrants, so that's the, our visual field. Les has only lower right quadrant remaining, so he is missing all of this vi visual field and vision and only has tiny little quadrant here. So imagine doing activities of daily living on a daily basis, you know, bathing, shaving your face, uh, watching television, um, cooking. Les is an avid cook, uh, which is incredible. Um, imagine doing all of his activities with the, the tiny little island remaining. So after initial evaluation, um, we discussed our plan of care, and our goal was to um, help Les to see um, a little bit more, expand his visual field. And uh, we tried many different approaches, and we kind of ended up going with reverse telescope, um, which um, the, um, when you use it in the regular way of telescope, it actually magnifies things, makes things slightly larger. But when you, you use it in the reverse position, it makes things a little bit smaller, but you can see more of it. An initial response that Les gave us after looking through the telescope was priceless. And I knew we were going to be successful because of that initial um, response. In the very first visit, we could not believe it. She provided Les with so many tools to use. Uh, the, the white cane, a uh, handheld uh, telescope, some sunglasses that were prescription, uh, they reduced glare, uh, regular glasses, of course, and then a specialty pair of glasses that have uh, reverse telescopes that just flip down. Um, he's only the second person in the U.S. to receive those. So what they do is take his little spot of vision that he can see with and like looking through a telescope in reverse, it just broadens it out so that he still sees, of course, with that little spot, but it, it opens bigger. it up. It's a little bigger, yes. Right, it opens it wider. So um, all that in the very first day. And it, was, it was amazing because I, I, so many things that were just 
she was bringing one thing and after another, just taking care of everything, and I was so happy. Now go back. Mm -hmm. It was a lot to take in. When I got home, I had all these new devices to use to help me. Mr. Franklin, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Nice to meet you. How are you doing today? All vision rehab services are very much goal oriented. You tell us what you're not able to do, we'll try to figure out how to fix that. The biggest um, um, complaint that people get, I want to manage my own bills because it's independent. I don't want to rely on any, on any other family members to manage my own bills. So we can start as um, simple as stronger reading glasses. And if it's not satisfactory, we can go with this handheld magnifier with additional lighting or their stand magnifiers are available. So it all depends on what veterans, um, uh, what patient's vision is, what their contrast sensitivity is, and what their goals are. We usually match uh, their goals and their needs with the device. With technology moving forward so fast, we also um, keep up with all the technology. One of the uh, bigger um, items would be um, Alexa. So VA will provide the device and will provide the training on the device um, as well. And the Alexa alone actually may replace a um, number of low vision devices or can address many, many of um, needs and goals. Um, for example, if a veteran wants to know, or any, any visual impaired um, individual wants to know what the weather is like, they could just say, Alexa, what's the weather? You know, or Alexa, play um, music, such and such. Again, it seems like losing vision is the end of life, but it's not. There's so many resources out there. So the first step, if you're not enrolled with the VA, um, the first step would be to give us a call and um, initiate the process of enrol enrollment. Once you're enrolled in the system, um, we'll give you all the numbers for low vision professionals. You could just call us directly and schedule an appointment. She is just on top of everything. Tell, you know, she works with me, one, you know, talks to me about things, asks me questions, checks everything, and she gives us websites to check, apps to use. And she follows up all the time. She's in constant contact with Les and I, just to see even if it's just how we're doing, um, anything new, anything we want to talk about. So it's, it's um, a really good relationship, one that he's never had with any of the other doctors through the years. I think it's going to, going to get better. The more I do, the more I try, the more I see Dr. Whitman and use the VA, it's, I'm, I'm, help, I'm hopeful for a good... I'm, I am hopeful, yes. I feel lucky that I can see what I can see, mm -hmm. and I am thankful mm -hmm. for that every day. What does a healthy lifestyle have in common with managing type 2 diabetes? It turns out there's a lot, and that's good news because it puts you in the driver's seat when it comes to managing type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is the most common form of diabetes, 
It occurs when your body is unable to properly use sugar, also called glucose, that comes with the food you eat. That means your body can't make enough insulin or use your own insulin properly. The result is too much sugar in your blood, which can also lead to serious health problems if it isn't managed well. If your blood sugar is higher than normal, but not high enough to be type 2 diabetes, that's called pre-diabetes. But remember, you are in the driver's seat, and a big part of achieving good blood sugar control is a balancing act between the food you eat and the physical activities you do. Healthy eating is about having three meals a day, managing portion sizes, and knowing how to fit in carbohydrate foods that break down into sugar, like fruit, rice, bread, and even sweets. A good rule of thumb is to fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables, which includes almost all vegetables. Getting regular exercise goes hand in hand with what you eat. Exercise uses the sugar from food to fuel your muscles. This helps keep your blood sugar levels in a healthy range. Exercise and physical activity also help with losing or managing your weight so your body can use insulin better. Try to get 30 to 60 minutes of physical activity on most days and try to limit the amount of time you spend sitting. Remember, any amount of exercise or ways you can move your body will help. That includes activities like doing yard work or taking the stairs. Sometimes daily medications are needed to help your body keep blood sugar levels in a healthy range. That may include taking pills or taking insulin shots. Another important part of managing type 2 diabetes is checking your own blood sugar. This gives you instant feedback about how you are doing. It's like checking the dashboard in your car to make sure everything is working well so you can get to where you're going. One thing is for sure. There will be some challenging times along your type 2 diabetes journey. But with the help of your VA healthcare team, you can plan for some of the most common challenges like learning to identify and know what to do when you have low and high blood sugar levels and how to manage days when you're sick. Having some healthy ways of coping will also help when things get tough. Faith-based activities, meditation, exercise, and enjoyable hobbies are just a few ways to deal with these emotional stresses. And be sure to surround yourself with positive people who support you, your family and friends, or maybe join a diabetes support group where you can share with others who have the same challenges you have. When you manage your type 2 diabetes well daily, you also reduce your risk for developing complications later on, like heart, kidney, and eye disease, nerve problems, and foot infections. It also helps to see your VA provider regularly, to get all your recommended immunizations and eye exams, and to quit if you use tobacco. Remember, there's no one approach for managing type 2 diabetes that works for everyone. That's the most important part of the VA's whole health approach of providing care to veterans. So, based on your needs and your preferences, your VA healthcare team will help you develop a plan and learn the skills for what work best for you so that you can get on with enjoying your life's journey. For more diabetes and pre-diabetes information and resources, visit www.veteranshealthlibrary.org. Copyright 2019, United States Department of Veterans Affairs. All rights reserved. That wraps up this edition of Veterans Health Watch. If you are a veteran, apply for VA health care. You deserve it. Just go to our website to find out how. You can find more episodes of Veterans Health Watch on our YouTube channel. Just type in VA Maryland Healthcare System in the search bar. And be sure to hit the subscribe button to get notifications of new videos. Don't worry, it's free. We'll see you on the next Veterans Health Watch.